Thank you, uh, David, Claire, Jolyon, everybody. It's lovely to be here. How are you doing? After that, um, I'm not sure how to follow that, uh, except to say it made me think about, like, what are we going to do with all those jobs that go away when the, when the bots uh, finally arrive? And um, uh, like most of you in the room, I always listen to and do exactly what Claire asks me. And so she asked me to talk a bit about some of the stuff we've learned about skills and how people are going to re-equip themselves for the changes that are ahead of us through machine learning and automation and some of those themes. And, and maybe that was a great setup for that uh, conversation, whether it's 20 years or two years, depending on which newspaper you read, I guess. So I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about that. But, but to start, I thought I would tell you a, a story. How many people here sometimes feel a bit old and want to look fabulous? Anybody? Yeah. Come on, be honest, I can see you. I can see you, the lights are up. OK, so a few of us. Uh, I want to tell you, tell you a story. Um, uh, about this woman. Um, about six years ago, I got an email, and uh, just from a random person. And I quite often get emails from people saying, when you drive past with the Street View cars, could you let me know next time, because my bins were out last time, and I don't want the photograph of my house to have bins outside. <laughs> but this was an email um, which was rather more welcome. It was an email that said, um, I want to say thank you to you at Google, because you've really changed my mother's life. That's kind of interesting. That's a nice one. Don't often get nice ones. So um, I followed up, and long story short, I met Trisha. And Trisha said to me, I was a 65-year-old grandmother. I'd finished work. And to be honest, I was bored out of my mind. And I was also feeling my age. So I went online, and I started looking whether there were any cosmetics that were designed for the skin of an older person. And it turned out that there were. And then I started using those cosmetics to do little makeovers for people, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and then I thought, I'm going to have a website. So I found a local guy, and he made me a website. And we shot a little video. And he put it on the website. But to do so, he put it on YouTube so that we could host it on the website. And the next day, I had over 1,000 views. And that's Trisha Kusden. And Trisha uh, started her business, Look Fabulous Forever, based on the fact that there were other people out there like her. She now has a multi-million turnover business, 60,000 customers worldwide. The US is one of her biggest markets. Uh, thanks to harnessing her creativity and uh, digital skills and technology. And that's the tech company of the future, an everyday business where creativity and skills can connect you to people in a way that was never economically possible before. When I was growing up, only the world's biggest companies could do that kind of thing. Now you can do it with a smartphone and an idea using carbon-neutral cloud technology. This is what it's all about. So, um, creativity, I'm going to talk about how that's harnessing uh, creativity to use the tools of technology in responsible ways. By the way, this is a great business because it's connecting to people who are sometimes in not a great state, helping them with their confidence. It's an ethical business, no cruelty, and all the products are now uh, made in the UK. So I went to Brussels, and sometimes I have a great time in Brussels because we signed up five years ago to something called the Grand Coalition of Digital Skills and Jobs. So the EU produced a report that said that a million jobs in Europe were going to go unfilled because of a lack of digital skills. And at the time, I'd just taken on this job, which was to run Google in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And we were looking at how can we make a bit more of a contribution. And so we took this as a challenge. And we had an event here. And there's Trisha sitting next to here to the founder of Happy Socks. Anybody have Happy Socks? Great Swedish brands. And Booker Tiger here, which is, oh, there's Happy Socks, sorry. You can see his socks. Um, the clue was in the sock. Uh, and Booker Tiger, which is an uh, online um, domestic services business in Germany. And we talked about what they were able to do in the same way as, uh, as Trisha. So we challenged ourselves. And on that day, in 2015, we launched a challenge to try and train a million people in digital skills in Europe within two years. We were blown away by demand. We trained a million within a year, always in partnership. So in Spain, it was targeting youth unemployment, working um, with a whole bunch of educators. In Germany, it was working on the Mittelstand. In the UK, it was going outside of London, opening shops in Sheffield and Leeds, uh, on, a, on a bus tour of the Scottish Highlands. We were, we were blown away by demand. And I'll tell you a, a bit more about what we learned uh, from that. But that demand meant that in the space of a year, we trained a million. Now, five years later, we've trained six million people in digital skills in Europe. We've trained 13 million in EMEA, and we've trained 43 million globally. I'm not pretending this is a degree. 
Uh, it's tailored to your needs. In many cases, it's giving you the first steps of confidence in digital, but it's also tailored to digital skills that can make you economically productive. Analytics, understanding how to use websites, do online marketing, social media, video, and so on and so forth. And so we've learned a, a lot about that. Uh, a couple of other things uh, I'd say is that half the people that we've trained, half of them were women. Turns out that half of people are women. And it's quite a good thing uh, to have women using digital to make businesses. Uh, and that was kind of interesting. 25% of the people we trained were unemployed. And over a million who we've now tracked have, in Europe have gone on to say that they've either got a better job, uh, a new job, uh, or grown or started a business. So we can really see that this is helping people to create economic uh, growth. This takes us back, doesn't it? Remember this? Happy days, 2012. And the creativity uh, of the uh, opening ceremony of the London Games. Celebrating Watt and the steam gen engine, Brunel and his engineering genius in the form of Kevin and Kenneth Branner, um, Whittle and the jet engine, but also Charles Babbage and the beginning of computing with Ada Lovelace and following through to Alan Turing, and then Tim Berners-Lee and that statement. You remember, this is for everyone. And I think we're at a moment where we've got a different kind of revolution, the industrial revolution, mass, mass production, zero variation at scale. Now we've got is the ability to arm people with tools that can be hyper-personalized but can still reach scale. We're at the 50-50 moment in that half the population is online and half the population on the planet is still to come. And that brings with it, with it incredible creative, economic, and educational opportunities, but it also brings challenges and issues. Tim Berners-Lee set up the Web Foundation and um, drafted a contract for the web. And Google was one of the first major companies to sign up to the contract for the web. And it lays out the obligations we all have, governments, individuals, and companies to try to preserve what's great about the web for everyone, for the next five billion people who come online. So for companies, uh, three obligations. The first is to protect uh, your data and respect your privacy. The second is to ensure that the web is open and affordable for everyone. And the third is to ensure that you build tools that bring out the best in humanity and challenge the worst. And I'm sure some of the things we've talked about here cover those areas. I think it's a really important thing uh, to be committed to. Um, when you think about that and you think about the UK, well, how's the UK doing in the world of tech to start off with? Pretty well. When you look at the e I don't suppose it will be part of this survey this year, but in 2019, the EU survey across all countries of digital economy and society, they have an index. UK is in the top five. So it's reasonably good, although more infrastructure investment and, and so on, as, as was being talked about, absolutely necessary. In the UK, when you look at digital uh, and tech as uh, an industry, it's um, the number two industry. It's not collected normally in this way, about 8% of GDP. It's obviously growing uh, faster. Investment in the tech sector, 2019, over 13 billion, up 30% year on year. Uh, AI, tremendous skills coming out of our university. At Google, we have DeepMind, which is world leading work on AI. Great talent that's here. Uh, when I started at Google in 2007, we had no engineers in the UK. We now have over 3,000, many of them building Android, most popular operating system that's allowing people to get mobile phones for under $30, bringing everyone uh, online. People sometimes say, well, you know, Google's just taking all the talent and buying all the companies. Just to give you some stats on that, over the 21 ge years that Google's been around, it's made about 200 acquisitions, most of them very, very small companies but about 2,000 companies have been started by Googlers who've left. I think one of the things that London and the UK has, and that's why we've been training people outside of London, is the opportunity for talent to really thrive in this space. And I'll talk a bit more about that as well. Um, so the tech industry here and the opportunity in AI and machine learning, I think, is enormous at this moment. We've got some great businesses. We're at the forefront of e-commerce in the UK. And you just heard from one of our best CEOs, Karen McCall, and I know you heard from Alex Mann earlier, public service broadcasting, journalism, music, gaming, content that's all digital, five billion more people coming online can access your content. This smells like a big opportunity if we manage to pay attention to what's going outside the UK rather than just inside the UK over the coming months. But I want to talk a bit about responsibility because one of the key things I see is that the, you know, the rules of the road need to be updated. And, uh, 
it's a bit like we've all gone quite suddenly from living in villages where we have social norms and lots of things just work because we know each other to a big metropolis, lots of shiny new stuff. How do we deal with all of those things? Whether it's our own habits at home, phones at the table, what age do our kids get access to things, whether it's regulations around copyrights or data protection. These are all things that need to be updated, but updated in a way that allows us to embrace the opportunities of the future while protecting what's important to us. So it's a really important time as those things get updated. Um, at the heart of how technology works and that contract for the web is your own privacy and security of data. You don't have security, you can't have privacy. If you don't have privacy, you can't enjoy the kind of web that we all want. And of course, the open and affordable web is massively funded by advertising. And making advertising that works in a responsible way in this web is really important. Advertising has to be personalized if it's going to monetize well. Uh, but it also has to be privacy first. And the EU is leading the way here with the GDPR. California's now got the CCPA, and it's going to come everywhere. So again, there's an opportunity, since we've got these rules first, to figure out how to do personalization and privacy that work hand in hand. And I think there are ways uh, that we're working on to do that. One of the things that I'm pleased of, that we've managed to do at Google is to have privacy and security built for every user in Germany by Germans. So this is the safety engineering center we opened in Munich last year. We now have over 1,000 engineers there, and they build things like the Google account, which is accessed 20 million times a day. You can go there and turn on and off personalized advertising and any other settings that you've signed into at Google in one spot. We've also been launching those kinds of settings in the individual app. So you can have incognito mode, or you can auto-delete location history if you choose to share location with your Android phone. After three months, it just deletes the history on a rolling basis, or 18 months if you choose longer if you want to remember that place you went to last year. So trying to give users transparency and control in an easy and effective way. Nobody has a higher bar globally on privacy and security, understandably, than the Germans. So why not build in Germany for everyone? Anybody used Google Translate? Yeah, is it okay? Have you noticed if it's getting better? Yeah, it's getting quite a lot better, actually, measurably. So we're now translating 150 billion words a day across over 100 different language pairs. That's a lot of talking to each other. What are people talking about? The three most common phrases across all languages are, how are you, thank you, and I love you. Isn't it great to build all that technology just so people can share their love with each other? And that's what the best of technology is all about, right? Bringing down barriers so that people connect on a, on a human uh, level. Um, part of what we all need to think about, though, is how we harness all this technology in a sustainable way. And I know sustainability has been one of the themes. And in fact, if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, the belief that companies can do good and should be doing good in this area in particular, really important. So just a bit about what we've been doing. So I joined Google in 2007, and that's the first year where we became carbon neutral. So we've got some experience at this. There are headlines you read these days about like streaming content on the web is destroying the planet faster than air travel. I'm not sure that's quite correct. However, it's a challenge, right? We need to make sure that what we're doing, the plumbing and the data centers are um, carbon neutral. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. So carbon neutral to, since 2007. But much more than that, we've tried to innovate in renewables. So for the last two years, Google's been the biggest corporate purchaser globally of renewable energy. 100% of our energy consumption now we match with renewables. Uh, and we, not only do you do that, we try to find ways to open up markets by doing it. So we won't invest in an existing wind farm or solar farm. We'll be the first investor in a big new uh, facility in order to cr increase uh, capacity on the planet. So I think the number is something like 51 gigawatts of um, energy, uh, renewable energy that we've managed to bring online in that kind of a way. And we're doing things to build tools for other people. So there's projects Rooftop, which is about solar panels on private roofs, um, mapping and using AI for things like flood detection and pre prevention. So there are lots of things there which I think is an, our obligation to share the work we're doing with other companies to help us move forward on the sustainability agenda. But I want to talk a bit more about the, the future of, uh, of work. Now, we're doing some work at the moment with some consultants uh, to analyze this across Europe, because um, people are worried, again, by the headlines. Will all the jobs go away? Now, the, 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 the work we're doing, and it's not quite ready for publication, suggests that more jobs are going to be created than go away. The challenge is, who will get the new jobs? And what do you do with this, the people who need different skills uh, to play in this uh, space, and that's one of the things that um, we've said is important. So the program 
which has trained 43 million people around the world, we call Grow uh, with Google. And um, as I say, half of the people we've trained are women. Um, we see economic impact from people being trained, in many cases, just from an increase uh, in confidence. In the UK, over 400,000 people we've trained with this program, as I say, focus on outside London, going to where people feel uh, left behind. I uh, hope that Boris didn't get the idea from us, but it was an important thing to get out and hear and see what people uh, were doing there. Um, here's one example. This is Amy Nolan. She was working in the Royal Berkshire Hospital. Her partner is in the RAF, was re relocated somewhere incredibly remote, and she wasn't able to find any uh, useful work. So she set up this business, Ginger Rainbow, which is pillowcases that children can colour in and send to overseas forces. Really nice niche business, but that can go global through digital skills. She came to one of our digital skills workshops in conjunction with a charity. That gave her the confidence to get going on that. She's now started a second business providing project services uh, for business uh, as well. So it's another example of how people can uh, be empowered with tools and technology that's simple to put their creativity in practice. Now, it's not just everyone, but also we want to try to fuel the, the technology economy as well. So this is uh, Google Campus London. We opened it in 2012. Um, it was the first time we'd done anything like this. And again, it was to try to see whether we could play our part in stoking the fires that then were just starting in terms of the tech startup, startup scene here. Since then, it's become a global program. Google for startups were all around the world with this, less often in the physical location. We trained, uh, we have 90,000 members uh, for campus uh, in London, Google for Startups London. Over 220 million of funding has poured into them uh, over the time since we, uh, which we uh, launched it, and it's created over 5,000 jobs. Well, the entrepreneurs there have created over 5,000 jobs. So you can see this stuff snowballing as more and more people are out there who, who've done this. One of the other things we're all concerned about if we're parents is the skills that our children need if they're going online. I think that's something that's really important, again, for us all to, to think about. So. Um, 97% of teachers apparently say that um, understanding how to navigate the digital world should be important to children and they should learn this at school and home. I don't know what the other 3% think, but you think 100% of teachers would think that's important. However, um, with the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, we launched something called Be Internet Citizens, which was all about helping children to understand what might be fake or manipulative uh, online. Uh, we launched uh, Be Internet Legends, which is with Parents Own in partnership helping primary schools understand the world of the web. 60% um, of UK primary schools have now been reached by that program. 270,000 kids have been reached by that in assemblies. 1.5 million times teachers have taken those resources uh, to children so that children are better equipped in this digital world to understand real from freight, to avoid manipulation, to keep themselves safe online. Really, really important thing for us, us to do together. And we just did some work with Demos to look at online learning. So online learning, um, particularly people use search and video for this, so we wanted to understand what we can do better. Those are the top two sources of online learning. What they found was, in a survey of 20,000 UK citizens, that online learning was good for the economy. People saw a 10% productivity boost when their workers were doing online learning for new skills. It's good for your career. Two-thirds of workers using search and video and other uh, online tools to equip themselves better uh, to advance in their careers. It's good for your mental health. 77% of people who've done online learning, online learning reported that it, it made them feel better mentally and improved their mental health. Um, it's good for your pay packet as people advance in their careers. And it's also good for everyone. So a bit like Trisha's example, you might think this is just young people doing this. But 57% of the over 50s report that they're learning something new online each week through uh, video in particular. Um, so this is something that's happening quietly inside every business. There's an opportunity for policymakers, perhaps, to help businesses ensure that people have got the time and the capacity to do all of those things. So I'm coming to the end of my time. And just to go, to go back to the sort of theme I was uh, asked so persuasively to talk about, this is a huge opportunity. Um, if people have the right skills to harness their own creativity and do something that was never possible before, was never possible in the mass market industrial revolution, but it is possible now in the personalized but scale cultural and creativity revolution that's happening. What does that mean for uh, the UK? And I think you've heard lots of the opportunity here throughout the day. We have got leading edge skills in the technology sector. We have got the world's best regarded brands in the media sector, journalism, public service, broadcasting, games, content, 
and on and on and on. There's a huge opportunity here. 50-50, half the planet's online. 50-50, we're on a knife edge in terms of what our new relationship will, is going to be with the world. How's that going to go? Lots of uncertainty. But if we look at the big picture, 5 billion people still to come online wanting to access great quality content, retail opportunities, and services. I really feel very optimistic about that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. Uh, it's a wonderful survey of all the um, social impacts and opportunities as you set out. Um, a couple of, just a couple of questions whilst we've got you. Um, the government seems minded to ask uh, Ofcom and our regulator to uh, get more actively involved in online harm. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we're, we are leaving the EU. Yep. Um, just summarize for us kind of your thoughts around the implications for, uh, for Google in, in terms of sort of how the, how the regulatory split will affect the business. Well, I mean, it's, it's too early to say. Um, I think in terms of, you know, we're powered by our customers ultimately, which are generally small businesses. So the more there's a common rule book, the easier it is for them to reach scale. So you'd be looking at that. Second thing I noticed, as I say, I spend lots of time in Brussels. I do think there's a challenge for Europe with the loss of the, U the UK's voice, which has tended to be more future looking uh, and uh, more um, open. And there's potentially an instinct for being a little bit more protectionist in the remaining powerhouse of Europe at the moment, if you can get my drift. So I think there's an important role for the UK to play in having the right set of policies that allow technology to empower people to scale fast, which means a degree of alignment on these things. On harms and responsibility, I think everybody's looking at that, rightly so. We tend to be in the room now having those conversations and sharing how technology and rules and laws can work together and to get better outcomes than one or other on their own. And if you look at some of the stuff we've done on, uh, on YouTube content, we now kind of take down I think over 80% of violative content in the violent extremist category, which is really hard because it tends to be somebody talking about politics, take down 80% of it without a single human view. So I think, you know, and being transparent about that, we can show how to do that. Can you get to 100? 100% um, without a single human view, I think is difficult because if you asked everybody in this room, we wouldn't probably agree on some of those edge case things. But what we found is by working with people like the Institute of Strategic Dialogue and others, we can write policies which we can train people to implement pretty accurately. The people can then train machines, and then you can use the people to do the tough stuff. We had a panel earlier on media disruption, and all the publishers were pretty much on the same page about wanting to sit back down with you yeah. uh, and get, get a, a new compact with regard to quality journalism yeah. in an area of fake, fake news. Will you do that? Well, actually, we work, I mean, I'm not sure they would have said it here, but we work very closely with every single one of the major publishers. Uh, we send them tons of free traffic through search. Uh, Google News is about helping quality publishers be found. We only have publishers who are who they say they are who employ journalists. So I think it's something like uh, 10 billion times a month we're sending uh, traffic from that service to European publishers. Then we help them monetize 14 billion a year. So people think about us in advertising revenue. Aside from search, uh, all of the advertising revenue we make, the majority of it goes to the inventory owner, whether that's you know, a Channel 4 or the Telegraph or Look Fabulous Forever if they want to have advertising. So we're helping to pay for the free and open web. Uh, and I know that the advertising money online is not the same as the advertising money if you control ITV1, but you know, that's part of the, the challenge. Absolutely partnership. Um, I'd say there's robust conversations, but there's also really good collaborative conversations. And you know, we're here for the long term. We're, an we're a business that's about access to information. So we want quality content to thrive, and we want fakery to be inaccessible. So it's in our long-term long interests too. Um, when we all go home tonight, we'll probably be bombarded by the latest sort of chapter in the COVID-19 mm. story that's unfolding. Um, Google obviously has a finger on the pulse. Mm. Uh, and we heard, again, from some of the publishers earlier around sort of the level of consumption of information. Mm. But in terms of sort of also that balancing act of uh, response, responsibility mm. towards um, society and, mm. and, and, and getting through this in a collective way. I mean, what are, the, what are the main sort of challenges that you're facing right now on this? Um, well, like everyone, we're looking at how do we keep our people and operations safe, and that's changing by the hour. In fact, I'm off back to review where we are now, so I'm responsible, for example, for Italy that's in a different place, so lots of that. 
the biggest responsibility we have, obviously, is to users. So for a long time, with health queries, we try to make sure we surface the most authoritative content. And we work with each domestic government, so the UK health minister is in touch with us, making sure that the NHS data here is there in preference perhaps to WHO, because you want to make sure in these times of crisis there. So there's lots of stuff we do in a sort of crisis response mode through our products and will continue to do. The other thing you can do if you want to is use Google Trends to see like, what's happening with searches for different things. And obviously there's also an economic impact as well. So we help companies to figure out when demand, like the travel sector, it's basically an emergency state. So how can you figure out what people are doing if they're starting to think about maybe holidaying at home rather than abroad, can you sort of turn your fire to that? And again, sort of the insights and things like Google Trends can help you get an early fix on those things. But primarily the focus is on sort of public health and accurate information. Great. Well, it sounds like you're having a, a, a busy day already. Um, thanks very, very much for being here. Matt Britton. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Cheers.